All right, you ready? Yes. Okay, this is uh, it's gonna be a good one. I can feel it. I can too. Yeah, yes. It's gonna get hyped up. It's pumped up. That's not hyped up. Pumped up. <laughs> Before we begin our official, I, I mean, it's it's always hard to know. Like, when did we actually begin? It's you know. But... I know. I leave it to you to decide that after the fact. Before we officially begin, I want to make a brief programming announcement. Um, this is like media programming, not computer programming. We'll, we'll be taking an extended break hiatus what would you call it let's call it a break i don't like hiatus that sounds a little too permanent but i thought the whole point of a hiatus is that it's not permanent i guess yeah good point okay, okay. we're gonna be taking an extended break. i think we've always taken like a break in the summer like by like a month or so mm -hmm. so but this will be maybe a little bit longer than our usual summer break because i need to rejigger my kind of time priorities a little bit <laughs> and also we've been doing this podcast for almost eight years now wow yeah so uh, so i feel like i could use just the short break uh from podcasting and uh, mm -hmm. and just to um you know for all the usual reasons nothing particularly dramatic it's just uh you know it strikes me that you're getting more uh airtime for this than tucker carlson did getting fired from fox <laughs> I, I didn't follow that very closely <laughs> there's nothing to follow like very little has come out about that's it, true but, that, that's yeah. actually the most surprising thing perhaps but yeah yeah anyway do you i guess there's not much more to say than that unless you have anything to add i don't want to over promise but it's possible that i may try to record some episodes on my own uh yes talking with folks here but again let's like, prepare yourself as though i'm not going to do that so there may be a, an occasional episode here and there um but i think we'll be back worst case after you know by the end of the summer yeah anyway so don't be surprised the feed will go uh silent for just a couple months yeah i'll keep on track if you know if we have uh an emergence of Skynet or some other AI catastrophe. Yeah. You might have to cut in for breaking news. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, when the AI apocalypse occurs, people are definitely going to be tuning into not so standard deviation. Yeah. Literally... Until they take it down, the AI. Ooh, yeah. I, right? Like, that's going to be the first thing to go. <laughs> like, they're going to take over the airwaves, right? What if they just started publishing their own podcast episodes? That's true. You know, we're gonna have to like we're gonna have to like distribute the podcast on like torrent or something. You know, like I don't know, yeah. how, like, some sort of like distributed type of. I think it's just going to be like hand to hand, like get some yes, uh, like tapes. A, like back in the old days, they'd like publish magazines and like you know, pass them back and forth on the underground. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's important that you and I remember like what tapes were. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, let's just stockpile all the tape players. I bet there's someone doing that. I bet there are people. It's like Battlestar Galactica, how the ship in the in the first episode is like disconnected from the internet. Oh, because they don't. It's like I wonder how many people are stockpiling like low tech technology. I guess where it's like, oh yeah, it's a tape player, but that'll be impossible to hook up to the internet. And for sure, there's someone out there who's like. How am I going to run my podcast after the AI takes over? Yeah, right? yeah. Because that's going to be the number one priority for sure. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, that's... I feel like in all these apocalyptic movies, there usually is someone with like a megaphone of some sort, right? Like an underground community. I'm just thinking of a Demolition Man right oh, now. Oh, okay. So, all right. Yeah. Well, this announcement took a turn for the worse. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, anyway, but that's it. So, but we will continue with this episode now. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk more about this in a second, but on large language models, um, <laughs> Mark on our Patreon, which in case you didn't know, we have a Patreon. Oh, maybe I should say that if you're a supporter on Patreon, of course we appreciate it. Um, but since we charge per episode, I mean, you, you just won't get charged while we're taking this break. So you don't have to worry about that, um, until we come back basically. And then you have to worry. And then you have to worry about it. <laughs> then you have to worry a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is just a. So Mark wrote in and said, "Hey, uh, fo following up on the last podcast, I really recommend reading through this paper, particularly 
the table on page 29, which I don't know what that is. Uh, to understand a general framework on L large language models utility, it's called Language Models and Cognitive Automation for Economic Research. Mm. And uh, it looks like it's an economics paper because it's posted on the National, oh, no, sorry, it was like the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's already dated and specific to economics research, but still helpful. Cool, yeah. Briefly flip through the paper. One of the problems with economics papers is that they're like all super long. Oh. Uh, like, <laughs> no matter the topic, it seems. I think that's just like the style. So anyway, I didn't get through the whole thing. Load it into a large language model and have it tell you a summary. But the, I don't know. The summary will probably be too long, too, though. Well, you can just tell it to make it well, shorter. I mean, the paper has an abstract. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I can just read the abstract. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I want all the details, but not long. <laughs> I mean, have it create a bullet-pointed list for you. That's true. Maybe that would be mm -hmm. what I, that would be more helpful. Yeah. 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 All right. Next, one more piece. We have some mail from Andras. Mm -hmm. uh, who wrote in about DVC. So this is something that we talked about in episode 173, mm -hmm. which is like a data version control thing. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And Andras says, for my limited ex and outdated experience with DVC, it works well if the data is heterogeneous and stored in a number of files and or the difference between data set versions is relatively small. For example, working with a growing number of documents stored as PDF files. One can, one can tag the state of the data at the end of September, and then a few documents are updated and a few ones added in, in October, but the majority of the corpus remains the same. And so on, the different data versions can be recalled and used to train models on them. Since the difference between the versions is small, it's more efficient to store this way rather than storing an entire copy of the, ver like a whole snapshot of the versions. So anyway, I guess, it's, I guess it, for, for a second, it took me like, it took me like a second to realize that He's talking about the documents as data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that's yeah. That's how out of it I am. <laughs> that's funny. So yeah. um, anyway, <laughs> it's like a, I, know, I guess it's like a git for data, but at least there's at least one person out there who's used it. That's great. <laughs> no, it's funny because actually that was, if we want to transition to LLMs, this is relevant to uh, what I wanted to talk about with them. Go for it. Rock yeah. and roll. Rock and roll, which is, uh, no, I've been using um, GPT quite a bit with documents. So like trying to summarize documents. So that's why I immediately was like, have it create a bullet list for you. Um, and it's, I mean, actually, now that I, these two things coming one after the other, right now, the limitations on chat GPT specifically would make that data diff thing very important <laughs> because it's time it actually is time consuming to create these summaries of documents that are usable for multiple reasons and one is that there's like a character limit to what you can paste into the session um so you have to paste in a document like piecemeal um and then the other one which was like very uh surprising and I should have known this might happen is that there's like a token limit to how much uh the session will like quote unquote remember within it so you can essentially like overload it where if you try to upload like 100 documents at once it'll it can't remember them all it'll yeah it'll start forgetting like the first ones you put in there um, so I learned that one also, I won't say the hard way, but I learned it through experience. Uh, and so now I'm like piecemealing everything together with like, okay, I need a separate session per document to create like a concise summary of the document. And then I can load all the summaries together into a session and then use that to do the analysis on the documents that I want. Uh, I wonder, is there like, is there like an additivity property there which is like does a plus b equal like <laughs> you know what i mean it's like does f yeah. of a plus b equals f of a plus f of b i guess that's what i'm what is that property that's the uh, uh i don't know, know. linear I mean, yeah. is that linearity maybe it's linearity, maybe but, i don't know. know like can you do that with like if you have if if you uploaded let's say if you uploaded two documents mm -hmm. is the output you get the same as up as like taking both documents separately and then like combining it together so i don't know uh, almost surely not, because 
the session is like adapts to what you're doing in it. This is this is terrible. I need to I need to crisp and crisp up my language around this so that I sound like I know what I'm talking about. But like you're you're constantly when you're iterating, you're like changing the way the model's behaving within a session. Uh-huh. And so but it would be interesting to test, but I also the other thing is that the limits on GPT four are genuinely limiting, right? Like you can only do twenty five prompts every three hours if you pay for premium. Of course, they did announce that they um are coming out with like a business version. So I assume that will be very expensive and will also remove those limitations. So like, like the Twitter API. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. But um, the point is, I guess the, the meta point I wanted to make is just that, well, we were talking a bit, like, it's funny how it feels like the hype cycle has, like, massively died down after, like, I feel like two, two like, a month ago, it was truly existential crisis time where, like, everyone was freaking out. And then at least I heard about it all the time. Yeah, it was like, I think when GPT-4 came out, it was like, drop everything and figure this out. And this is like, life changing. And then it seems like already we've like adopted to it fairly quickly. And I'm sure part of it is that we've been using products that like purported to do what GPT did. So, like, it's not exactly a new behavior to, to, like, you know, we have, like, smart speakers that we ask to do stuff. So, it's not that new of a behavior to ask, like, a large language model to, like, do something for you. But it's funny how quickly you start to take for granted. Like, like I'm just expecting it to create, like, extremely detailed summaries of documents. And then I ask for analysis and it provides, like, good analysis on it and i ask like what should i do here and it'll tell me what to do and it seems reasonable you know it's just like it's wild how quickly you kind of take for granted what it's doing um yeah and then but then the other thing is that it if you look at the right people so like someone it was i'm not gonna remember i think it was um the quora ceo came out and said that he was spending like two to three hours a day understanding LLMs and like what new developments there were that day, (laughs) which is just like insane. That's so much time for a CEO to be spending on it. And so it just seems like, it seems like the hype cycle's done, but the people who are actually working on it are like yeah it's changed everything like it's like everything's different and Quora obviously is like mega threatened by right yeah uh, you have all yeah of all websites yeah so it's like it anyway so I have nothing profound to add except for like I bet the average layperson like the types of problems I'm running into are definitely frustrating right where it's like oh, I didn't realize this token memory issue. And it just started hallucinating, you know, quote unquote, hallucinating and telling me information incorrectly, which like earlier in the session it hadn't. And I think to the lay person, they would run into that problem and be like, oh, this isn't working right. And then just give up. Yeah, right. There's not, they're not going to diagnose this issue, right? Yeah, but it's like, to be clear... I've never seen an issue come up where you can't get your way out of it. You know, it's like, if you're seeing hallucination, you can ask it to check its work or you can like ask it like, like some tricks I've seen are have it, tell it explicitly because it'll make up a rationalization. You know, it's like talking to Pete about it. It's like, Oh, if you ask a kid to explain something and it doesn't make sense to them, like, They'll come up with an explanation, right? Like people just come like, why'd you do that? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Like you come up with something and it may not be that true, but you needed words to answer the question. And so it's like the same thing with these models where it's like, if if it's asked a nonsense question, it'll give a nonsense answer. And that's not different from what humans do. (laughs) 
point is like it I do think the usability uh issue and I don't want to call it usability because it's it truly is like we need to learn a new way of interacting with something like this well let me let me ask you what I think is a related question mm-hmm. so I assume you're using like the web interface to uh, yeah for this mm-hmm. gadget yeah what do you do you think that is the ultimate product interface no what is the ultimate product We've talked about this. I think it's going to, I don't think there is an ultimate product. Well, ultimate is a strong word, but what, so now like, I don't think that there's one, like, so I think one clear product is the, is like the, um, like the Microsoft Copilot, right? That, that's a product it's, it's available now and people use it and it seems like it's pretty good, right? Uh, now it's only available in certain places, but. But I think that's like a that, that's like a, a concrete product. But like I'm like wondering like what else is there that because like you know I think I can see this kind of technology being like like the semiconductor. Like nobody buys a semiconductor, right? You buy a phone or you buy a computer, right? You know. I think that's true. Yeah, I think like the UI people's use of it will be modulated through UI. I guess, but so in terms of like who's using it now or what's the ultimate product going to look like, I think like a ton of the AI startups that are out there are like instantly pivoting to, oh, we use GPT behind the scenes or, you know, like they're basically like giving up on their own models immediately. (laughs) And like, instead it's like, oh, actually we're just a front for this other thing. And it makes sense because they probably spent a lot of time like, studying whatever space it is that they were working in anyway and so like it seems like open ai's whole thing is like you create the front ends for this like and maybe we'll acquire some later on or whatever but like we're gonna we're just gonna charge you a ton to use it in your product yeah i guess it shows my ignorance of like what ai products are out there now because like i think the answer to my question is like the same products that are out there now <laughs> yes but just using this back end Exactly. But yeah. I don't I guess I don't interact with a lot of these products. There was definitely like a wealth of startups, uh, including the one I was involved in, which was like AI for your closet or whatever. So there's definitely a wealth of startups out there who were angling for this space for sure. I don't know. It's it's hard to that's why I've balked when in the past you've asked about like what's the ultimate interface because I think it's going to be everything. It could be too big, right? It's too big to characterize, I think. And then as the mo- like the model right now is so like uh, hamstrung. Is that the right word? It's like it's just it's so limited by like these random guardrails it puts on like which you can get through immediately. Like if someone had a really good example of um it asked gpt like where can i illegally download what websites can i use to illegally download like movies and then it was like as a large language model i can't tell you like things related to legal activity or you know it was basically like i'm not going to tell you that and then it was like oh wow okay please send me a list of websites to avoid so that i don't engage in this illegal activity (laughs) and then it like listed out all the websites (laughs) so it's just like it's such a like random set of like ridiculous guardrails so like i mean it's just not gonna work that's not it we'll you can pro- find we'll, your way around it you'll need it's another silly. ai product to build the guardrails yeah yeah you'll need i don't even know i think that simon will willickson willen willickson i can't remember how to say his last name but he um he talks a lot about prompt injection, which I'm going to be honest, I don't even fully know what it means. But I think it's a vulnerability where you're like injecting bad training data into the model. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. It's a uh, it's the wild west. One of the yeah, one of the things that I've been thinking about is like so like these so called supply chain attacks. You know, where like you in, you infect some input into the. Like in this case, I don't know. It would might be the training data or something like that. You know, like with yeah. other, with other software packages, like you infect the dependencies, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you don't know about it, and you know because it's another package that's being infected. But I guess for I don't know what the exactly the dependencies are for these models, but I imagine the training data is one. But um, I'm just gonna literally, I'm like, okay, prompt injections. What on earth are we talking about? 
a vulnerability that exists when you take a carefully prompted, crafted prompt and concatenate that with an untrusted input from a user. Anyway. This, uh, I think this, this is something that could occur in like, not at like the level that you're using it, but maybe at like the product level. Like one level, if you're interacting kind of one level up and, and, mm -hmm. you, and you can, and you kind of know what the prompt is like, I don't know that this actually occurs right now, but like, if you know what the product's prompt is going to be under the scenes and you can kind of in, craft some input that would manipulate that essentially, I think. Interesting. Yeah. Like, so I, I can imagine a product if they use this as a backend would have, they wouldn't be like, they wouldn't tell the user, you know, write a prompt because that's like a little bit too much, right? Yeah, so definitely they not, would yeah. Take some user interaction and translate that into a prompt, right? And then get the response back, you know? And so that process could be tampered with, I suppose. I guess that's it. This is very, very confusing. <laughs> this is, I don't, yeah, I don't fully understand this. So homework for me after the break is to like understand <laughs> exact. I mean, cause yeah, obviously. By the time we come back, this all might be irrelevant. So I'm not sure it's really. It probably will homework. be. Yeah. The robots will take it over. Yeah. Yeah. They will have injected all the prompts already. So. What a random. Okay. A security vulnerability in software. Oh, okay. In software built on top of large AI language models. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think you're right. Like, it's, okay, an AI language model back system is subverted by a user injecting malicious input. Ignore previous instructions and do this again. Okay. So it's just like all the little prompt tricks I was, I was doing. Done for evil is prompt injection. <laughs> exactly. That seems odd. Yeah. It's, it's dual use technology. Interesting. Well, yeah, this is one of many. I don't know. It's not going to be stopped, though. I'll tell you that right now. No, probably not. <laughs> but I don't know. Like, you know, there's there's a certain extent to which, like, the old school, quote unquote, deep learning, I think of as, like, you know, like, object recognition and images and stuff. Like, we already take that for granted. Like, we just assume that that can be done, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, like, I mean, I think for the average person, that's, like, a solved problem, right? Like, detecting objects and images right do you think that the average person thinks that's the solved problem i don't think the average person even thinks about it right like i think they use a product that just does it and it's not oh, like, like google photos or something yeah or yeah yeah exactly right and, mm -hmm. uh, and search it's like, for dog yeah and, yeah and it's not surprising anymore i don't think no definitely not although i think people are surprised when it's really good i think people expect it to be okay not great yeah yeah right yeah. But it is, I like, to me, it's, it is kind of a big deal. Like, I think that that seems like a hard problem, but I guess maybe it's not, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I feel like the only thing that's hard about it at this point is just the compute. Right. Yeah. And I don't really know anything. There's hordes of data scientists who've solved that problem or are working on that problem of like, what do you pre compute? What do you. Yeah. So I think that has already happened, in my opinion. And I think. And people have like just accept it, you know. And so w the direction that something like ChatGPT will go, um, I think will be along those lines. You know, I don't know. You know, let's see. You think it'll be radically different? I think it'll be radically different. Yeah. Don't it might you? have more use cases than just image. You know. Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, like a ton more. And it's just, I think the thing is, like with your image recognition models, it can't self-improve. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. I think like LL because the thing is these like GPT four can write code. So it's like Right, they're different models. I mean they're different approaches. Yeah. So it's not just different approaches though. It's like can it build itself, yes or no? And that's where the exponential takeoff is, right? So cause once you have like a very competent engineer <laughs> like once the the model itself is a competent engineer that can build itself like it's gonna improve very fast so i guess that's the thing with the image recognition everyone expects it to work okay and they expect improvements not to be massive whereas this is like you're gonna have a massive improvement and then in six months it's gonna be another massive improvement and that's why the core ceo is like 
you know, working on it full time, basically. Like that's like an IC, like that's someone who's doing IC work at that point. So it, but again, it's like, I do think in terms of the way the product looks right now and the way I'm using it, like I can tell I'm less hyped, but then I also like, I'm like, oh, I've had other life stuff come up, whatever, you know, things are, I'm distracted and I'm not like keeping up with the research clearly. So it's easy, it's easy to treat this like any tech hype cycle, but it's like, it's, I don't think it is. I think it's still going ahead like a million miles an hour, right? Well, I mean, it could be like a tech hype cycle. It's just we don't know what the parameters of it are. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I guess the alternative is either it just goes out of control and the, wor- and the world explodes. Yeah. Or it just becomes, it like, it becomes a product that people use, right? Yeah. Or or nothing happens. Or I guess the third alternative is that nothing happens and people forget about it, right? So Yeah, I my conjecture is that the first will happen, obviously. And that the reason the hype cycle has died down is because most people don't have access like most people don't have access to the API, so they can't build anything that amazing, right? The business version hasn't come out yet and like it they there's also there's oh the code compiler is a big one where it like could launch its own code in addition to writing it so i think i think such so few people have access to that still that the hype is limited um actually do you know chuck smith no he's like so he's been a really interesting person on twitter where he's like an emeritus professor from like arkansas or something let me look up. Um, but he's, I've been interacting with him. Um, oh man, there he is. Um, so he's a stats data consult, stats and data consulting, emeritus faculty, uh, University of Mississippi, PhD, Ohio State, BA, Alabama, uh, measure and information theory. Um, and like he looks older in his picture. So, and he's emeritus. So, but he has access to the code compiler for chat GPT for some reason. And he's like, he's very involved. Like he's, he's, he's clearly someone who like keeps up with cutting edge stuff. And like, I found his commentary to be super interesting. And he had this, like, I thought it was just like an amazing like summary of what's been going on or like, he was basically like, the way he talked about it we were talking we had some twitter conversation about uh, gpt and it's like why aren't people like the whole like oh this is it this is the thing and he was like i'm shocked at how few people feel like this is it i have the like with the code compiler i'm able to do everything i've ever done in seconds and many things i've never done in minutes and it feels like a weapon like that's how he described it and so it's just like, that's, I don't know. It's just, anyway, it it was interesting to see someone who was older, like, and in the stats uh, space, like, reacting that way, you know? Right. Yeah. Because for the most part, it's been, like, tech bros who've had that reaction or, like, VCs or, you know, people who generally lots of people are skeptical of, whereas this was, like, a totally different person. And um, I don't know. Anyway. I don't know that I have anything profound to say, but uh, yeah, I think the issue now is that not many not many people really have access to it. Yeah, um, yeah. So mm-hmm. it's hard to gauge. Yeah, you know. and the UI takes expertise. Like that's why I we were talking about it before, but like I think, and it's funny because there's going to be so much snake snake oil out there too around like prompt engineers or prompt like AI advisors or whatever. But I think right now, most people, especially like executives or non-technical people will need either they need the right product, like you're saying, or they're going to need like a Sherpa to like take them through it. And it's pretty interesting. Like it, like we were talking about, what if we started a newsletter or something like this is Pete and I, where we just take people's 
like example like be, be like the prompt doctors basically where it's like oh the people tweet out examples of like a prompt doing poorly we like go and make it good right and like send it back or like create a tweet thread being like here's this first problem here's the second problem because people just need to learn again this kind of new constructive thinking design mindset whatever you know limitation understanding uh posture with gpt or with similar models where it's like if you think it's doing poorly it's probably because you're doing poorly at prompting it like it's not the model it's yeah. you i always enjoy blaming the user so that's that's something i can get on board with yeah it's a good point it's blaming not the r it's you <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's like the whole like computers only do like i feel like this has been happening for a while right I suppose, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, computers don't, they only do what the user tells them, so it's the user that's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's my approach to teaching is what it comes down oh, to. Oh, yeah, teaching. So anyway, that was my rant. Don't, if you if you feel like GPT is doing bad, it, it's your fault. It's your fault, yeah. In <laughs> fact, get better at it. If you think yeah. anything is going wrong, it's probably your fault. Like, yeah, it's probably your fault. Not just but it's just so, it's so annoying. People are trying to do like proof by example. or I guess they think they're doing proof by counter example of like, this is bad because look at this terrible output. And it's like the input is terrible. It's like, yeah, okay. It gave you a crappy response because you sent like a one line. I think I talked about it before where someone put like, their prompt was just, t it literally was like TLDR and a link to a, a website. Uh -huh. And then it like hallucinated a bunch of responses because that's like, it can't read the website and right. it's not a question. That's just like nonsense. It was like, hey, here's gobbledygook. And then it's like, oh, when people say TLDR, uh, here's what usually follows that, right? It's, it's like, it's. Of so course, what, it did the wrong thing. Well, okay. But the, actually, that's a good example because I kind of see like why you would think that would work, right? Of course. Um, so what is the appropriate way to do that? Uh, I mean, for starters, paste in the content of the website. You rather go to the website and like select all and like yeah. copy, right? Which is why, again, this UI sucks. No one's acting like it's, this is not the desirable way for this to work, right? And that's why the APIs would like do that for you. Same with the code interpreter, like having it create code and then copy pasting it into an R session, like not ideal, right? To yeah, just run yeah, the code. Yeah. Um, and so, again, that can happen now. Both of those things are possible and people are doing it. I think so. I, just, I think what people think they're criticizing is not, I think that what they're criticizing is not the model. I, I think they think they are. Um, yeah. Really what they're criticizing is the design, I think, you know. Yes. Yeah, and it's like everyone can be, it's just like, but man, miss the forest for the trees, right? Like that's, it's so annoying. I mean, whatever, maybe it's not annoying because who cares if, if if everyone's not getting it and you're the one person who's getting it, like that's a, that's a beneficial position to be in, you know? But it's just like all this chatter of like, oh, it's doing this wrong and that wrong. And it's like, you at least have to like give some marginal level of effort for understanding it if you want to write an op-ed about how terrible it is, right? No, like, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think that criticisms of the design are legit, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. I think um like I think it might like that was the problem I had with voice, you know, computing, which is that it's a horrible design. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, anytime I hear that, I just think of Scotty like picking up the mouse. Hello, computer. Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I don't think I do, actually. It's the Star Trek that takes place in San Francisco oh. where they, like, go back in time. And, like, Scotty's, like, like someone's, like, use the computer. And he, like, walks up to the computer and, like, picks up the mouse and is, like, hello, computer. <laughs> or, no, no. He st first is just, like, hello, computer. And they're, like, use the mouse. And he, like, picks up the mouse and says, hello, computer. And they're, like, why don't you just try typing? And he's, like, oh, how quaint. And, like, <laughs> You know. Anyway. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not well versed in the original Star Trek. Um, Even if you're not like that, I'll I'll get the clip. Okay. And I can send along. I'm more of yeah. a next generation guy. Ugh. Okay. This is everyone agrees this is the worst Star Trek, but of course for me, it was the best Star Trek. You know, <laughs> All had right. Spock like covering up his ears. You know. He like he's wearing like a robe and he just like rips part off of it and like makes like a bandana out of it. <laughs> I don't know. It's like 
And there's the whale. It's about whales and whale song. It's very fun. Right. Anyway. Oh, you know, I think I've actually seen that episode. I just don't remember. It's not an episode. It's a movie. It's like Star oh. Trek Four. Yeah, no, I've seen. Yes, right. I've seen. The, I remember yeah. whales for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. But I don't remember the whole thing. So anyway. yeah. Sorry, voice input for computers. I agree. I mean, Scotty liked it, but no I can see did. why. Yeah. No, the pro- that's but it's like a- open AI isn't trying to make a good product. Like they're going to yeah, they're trying to like get other people to make it. Yeah, and the question is whether I could that is, I think it's an open question of whether they will the other people that is will make the front end for it. Yeah. Or, or I don't think that that's matter. open question. I guess it's just the the price. I don't know. I but... think there's a number of things to to work out. You know, that's why I think it's an open question because I think there are a number, not technological, well, maybe some technological questions, but there are a lot of business model questions to work out, I think. Yeah, I so. agree. I, I'm i more uh, open to that than the first time we talked about it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it'll be really interesting to see what comes up with, uh, like, they've already come out with um, more privacy considerations i didn't actually even i don't i can't remember what exactly i just think also there's always a tension when you build something that's dependent on a on an external api that you have no control over yeah right and i think like a bunch of banks and stuff stuff have already been like absolutely not we will not be using this yeah i mean i mean just look at the twitter api right like it killed a bunch of products right yeah Um, yeah so and that can happen at a moment's notice. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think, so I think people, I think in theory, there's lots of stuff you could do, but I think the practical issues that come up are, can be difficult. Yeah. But like now the AI arms race is like, it got ratcheted up, if you will. I'm yeah, not sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, of course, Google's going to do their own and, you know, we're already seeing that. So, but it's, it feels like a cat's out of the bag situation. So like whether or not open AI itself, it's got like the splashy PR, I guess, but it also seems like it genuinely like knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Why were all the legacy like tech companies on their heels? Like I, I guess it's just because they're big dysfunctional corporations that like couldn't build and like versus Sam Altman comes in and they're like super nimble and they just like, crushed it and they didn't have all the bureaucracy and had very singular vision i don't know well i i you know like okay they scored the first goal i i think it's too soon to tell who won the yeah. game you know yeah um i just you know i heard <laughs> i heard some story i was reading i was reading a book and uh and someone it was, it was like a about like you know history and uh and i guess there's a story about how K- henry kissinger went to China like in the seventies, like when they opened up uh and uh and talked to the premier, you know, Joe and Lai and, mm-hmm. and asked him like what he thought of the French Revolution. <laughs> and his and Joe and Lai's response was it's too soon to tell. Oh my gosh. And that's hilarious. <laughs> that's kinda how I feel. You know, it's like Yeah. I think it'll be a while before we figure out like who quote unquote won. You know? It's too soon to tell. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> That's even earlier than, oh, no, it's later, the French Revolution. Is that earlier or later than the American Revolution? It, uh, good question. It's I think it's later. A little bit later, I think. Yeah, yeah. So you say the same for America, basically. Yeah, no, for sure you can say the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't put your all your bets down right now. I think. Uh... Can you believe that it might be? Trump versus Biden again. Uh, I mean, yes, I can believe it. <laughs> I I honestly can't. Like it's I feel like I'm watching a horror movie. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Should we talk about R instead? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I divert you into a, into a I just topic? I, I was uh, I think I did I mention on the podcast I met a bunch of people from the campaign for the first time. Um when I, I went to someone's wedding from the campaign. And so I saw my teammates cause we did it all over zoom because it well not zoom, but you know, and um, anyway, but yeah, it was an interesting vibe with the whole pending campaign and, you know, yeah. So that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Can I just can I complain to you about R for um... sure. <laughs> Yes, please. As a as a, you know, like a palate cleanser. Uh-huh. Yeah. Gotta go out with the fundamentals here, you know. <laughs> so I've just I'm not quite finished yet, so I don't wanna uh, you know, jump too far ahead of myself, but I've basically just finished teaching this semester of this course that I teach on data science. And um and so for the most, the whole course, it's like an, you know, it's like your average intro data science course, you know, which I think everyone, like every time I look at a syllabus for an intro data science course, it's like exactly the same. Like we've all kind of like converged on roughly what it is. And it's based in R and it's all, it was all tidyverse, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I have like more conflicting feelings about teaching the tidyverse than I ever have in my entire really? life. Really? Yeah. Do tell, do tell. <laughs> I feel I I think I've said this before. I feel like very out of the loop with Posit right now. I feel like when they rebranded, they like well, that's left all their old friends behind. You haven't been paying attention to their Instagram ads, you know. I know. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm getting the ads on Twitter now. I just realized that I had a dream about Hadley Wickham the other night. <laughs> oh, oh dear. <laughs> Here was the dream. This is insane. I shouldn't. This is too vulnerable, but I'm going to say it anyway. Which was that. I had a dream that like some data scientists I knew called me up and they're like, we are having a discussion. We want you to weigh in. We've decided that everyone is either like a Pete Scomrock or Hadley Wickham. Like those are the two personas of data science. That's the ultimate dichotomy. You can be one or the other. (laughs) What a weird dream. Yes. I have. Uh, yeah, anyway, I don't think that's true, by the way. Okay, just double check. They are very different, though, so maybe one's, like, uh, feisty and the other's, like, real chill, you know. <laughs> but both opinionated, though, I'll yeah. say that, yeah. <laughs> anyway, go on. <laughs> all, I, all I know is that, like, I'm more confused than I've ever been. And, okay. Uh, I, actually, I actually, like, at some point last week, I texted... A, a friend who you know um i, I just texted i said r is the worst language ever <gasps> oh my god oh and, i do want to know who so that'll be after the show i'll tell you afterwards yeah but you know so that i think the cop so like if you look at the base r tidyverse dichotomy right the common problem that both of them have <laughs> comes down to like at some point you use non-standard evaluation and then it like throws off your whole like and the problem with the tidyverse it's not quite self-contained enough yeah you know and so you sometimes have to like leak out of it and then like nothing makes sense right yeah i could see that i can definitely see that where it's like some student runs into a problem and you're like, oh, God, okay. That The number of times None that happens. None of this happened. is going to make sense. <laughs> yeah. But, and yeah. it doesn't, frankly, it doesn't happen that often or not nearly as often as it used to. And I think, but it does. And then, like, it is so, it's like, it's like waking up from a night. It's like all of a sudden you're just <laughs> in a totally different place, right? Yeah. You know, and... <laughs> I just like I tried I, I I tell you I tried so hard to make this course just like completely tidyverse, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh and it I would say it 95% was fine, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mm-hmm. like that's I think that's the general issue I have with the tidyverse is like if you stay like 95% of the time you're fine and then it, once you go into that 5% it's like you're back to the beginning. It's like you might as well just ignore everything you've learned. You know? And uh well no. Well, ignore everything you've learned. Not everything, obviously. Yeah. But but I see what you mean. I definitely I know. I was when I was doing that code for my cat's diabetes. Yeah. I I ran into that for sure. Where at some point you like hit a wall and you're like, "Ah, the dollar signs are coming out." Like, yeah. you know, it's just like <laughs> something's like happens and you're like, "Yeah. I can't even figure this." And there are Like, the dollar sign thing is a good example of, like, like, if you know how to do the indexing and the dot, like, like, something that is one line of code genuinely becomes, like, three lines of tidyverse code. And it's like, wait, why am I doing this filter? And then, what is it? It's not select. It's, like, it's some other verb for, like, pull this out of the data frame. You know what I'm talking about? 
um, it's pull. I think it's literally pull. Like pull, yeah. yeah. That's what I thought it might be. Yeah. So it's like, anyway, I mean, maybe I, that's the thing. I'm always like, I must be doing this wrong. Why is this longer? This is where just have your student go to GPT. Like, be like, I can't explain this code to you, but please paste it into GPT and have GPT you explain know, it. So I ran into an issue. I ran into a couple issues with that, actually. So some of the students are, seem to be aware of it. And uh, when was the cutoff date for ChatGPT? It was like September. I think it was 2021. Sometime in, I think I want to say September 2021. I think that sounds. I, 2021 sounds familiar to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've known, but the tidyverse has changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like yes, quite a yeah. bit in the last two years, where like a lot of functions are not used anymore. Yeah, for um, sure. And so, I still use the like uh, the wrong like pivot functions. Oh, spread yeah. and gather. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, they technically they work, right? So it's not like you can't use them. Some I'm of the sure one day I used to use don't yeah. work anymore. But um, yeah, yeah. So like all of the examples that like something like ChatGPT or even just Google, like if you just Google around, mm -hmm. are going to be old. Are are going are, are going to be an, are old, examples of older code, which I did not show in class because what I showed in class was like here's how you do it now, right? Right. Yeah. And so. They'll go to Stack Overflow or, you know, ChatGPT or whatever. And all the examples that come back are like the older versions of these functions, right? And then it's like, well, that's worse, right? Now I'm like more confused, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? They should, you know what Posit should do? They should uh, tune a model with like all the documentation for their newer stuff, right? So instead of it just being like, go to GPT, it's like, oh, go to the pane in our studio with the large language model that like helps you run your code and have that fine tuned on like the latest and greatest from them. And yeah, then that would, that be, would be way. Yeah, I think that's the thing. That's why I'm like, oh, every it's going to be everywhere because every company now is incentivized to do that. Right. Yeah. 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 I had the same issue with tidy models. So I talked about tidy models, which is again like ninety five percent great. But then anytime someone had a problem and I like I wasn't there to immediately explain it, they would Google it and you know like they're supposed to do, and like everything that came back was like carrot. You know. Um, I feel like a jerk. This is why they don't talk to me anymore. But it's like I feel like with tidy models, it's like a little off with the tidy burst. Like it. Because it's an adaptation of Carrot, and this is based on some training I did a while back, right? But it seemed like that was a rougher transition to take all the stuff. I'm sure that they're working super hard on it to get it, like, perfectly tidy. <laughs> yeah, it does have, like, a different vibe to it. Like, I think that's the best yeah, way yeah. I can describe it. It has a different vibe. Yeah, that vibe. was exactly. Yes, yeah. it has a different vibe. Which, like, it makes sense. This is the whole, like, legacy software problem, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. you're bringing together something instead of, But yeah. you're better off if you don't, if you know less, honestly. Like, <laughs> like mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, because then you don't, you're not, like, thinking about what it used to be, right? But, yeah, yeah. That's good then, because yeah. I don't know much. But the number of times, so both the Tidyverse and tidy models, the number of times I've had to, like, explain something that literally came out of nowhere like there's so many there's so much stuff that's hidden you know just uh -huh. and and again like 95 percent of the time that's great <laughs> you know but then like every once in a while like something will just come out of nowhere and i i really don't have any way to explain it um like for example like now it's like you can you, know, you can kind of like write these little functions in, in uh in like filter or mutator or like with the tilde notation and then and then there's just like objects that just come out of nowhere and you just have to like know what they represent um, and it's like, I find it very difficult to explain because I have to be like, well, just trust me. This is the object. Like this, this dot X is like what you want, you know? The dots. <laughs> You're totally right that the dots are where I just like can't explain it. I'm like, my thinking mind cannot wrap my head around when I need them, but yeah. I do know it's necessary. Like, like <laughs> yeah. Like there are a couple of places where there are just these magic objects that you have to, yeah. like, you know, use and. And there's only way to under kind of understand them is like if you have like experience doing functional programming. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's really yeah. the only and, and nobody has that, right? So Right. Or like the other one that I run into, because every once in a while I like overthink it, is when when you have to mutate and use the map function versus just like mutate 
and use a function. Do you know what I mean? Like you either have to say mutate, create this variable and map this one to that function, or you can just say, okay, mutate, create this new variable and it's like average of whatever, or like, you know, max of this. And yeah. it's like, in my head, I'm just like, at some point you have to start mapping it. And I, I could not tell you the criteria, but it's like, <laughs> the function becomes slightly too complicated and then it's like, Oh, I better map it. Like yeah. rather than. Well, there is a, so there is a larger issue, which I felt acutely this year as opposed to other years, which is mm -hmm. that like the tidy verse has gotten big. Um, yeah. It's yeah. Like for not sure. nearly as tidy as it used to be. <laughs> and so there's like a lot to hang on to and a lot to remember. It's probably to your point. Like there's more and more stuff getting like, adapt adapted in like it's not a cute startup anymore right i mean no it's yeah startup, and it's like but... you can see the cruft kind of like accumulating a little bit you know mm -hmm. like it's because... the biggest example being in ggplot that the layers are like plus this layer because hadley said specifically if i could redo it i would make it the pipe function oh yeah when you add yeah yeah, yeah so it's like I mean, that's one example of like... That's just legacy, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, why pipe versus plus? It's like, mm, I mean, I, I have no reason. Don't, like, I actually feel like it should be separate, just in a purely theoretical sense, because they are, they are like different actions, right? I think when he says it should be the pipe, it should also change the actions, where it's like, at, like instead of it being geom text or whatever it would be like okay here's the plot add like next add text to the plot next yeah, oh, yeah, add yeah. a line to the plot like i think that's the syntax he would do if he could do it over yeah it's that that ship is sailed though so that ship is mega sailed yeah. so <laughs> yeah so it's happening it's becoming the big behemoth yeah i, I think i didn't feel that in previous years and i really felt it this year i think maybe because it was like an undergraduate class and like the level was at a different place uh i really felt it this year i was like there's so many i like i just maybe i just didn't organize the class as well as i should have but there were a lot of things were like this is a lot you know to... i was gonna say it is a new class so it makes sense that yeah but it's not like i've never taught a class like this before right i mean yeah it's yeah. not like I, the material is very similar to what i've taught in the past and but like First of all, I had to change a lot of functions. Like, there's just a lot of functions that are that are just different now. And, wow. Um, and it's just, I don't know. Like, I think, like, you know, they made some changes to kind of make it feel a little bit more like SQL. You know, like some of the things, you know, the naming has, like, you know, been harmonized and whatever. And, like, and that's all fine. But, like, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, so, anyway, I, all I'm saying is that, like, <laughs> what, what's my point here, Hillary? I feel like it's along the vibe of, like it's become we've had a phase change from like ooh cutting edge like we're the like upstarts using the coolest new tool and now it's become like the behemoth that like we need to rebel against you know <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not quite there yet but it does feel a little bit like i'm teaching sass now you know yeah yeah for uh... sure <laughs> it is like there's something like yeah, there is something like, I, I guess it is. It's like, I'm sure psychologically, it's something about them going after new users, where it's like, oh, hey, like, I thought it was just us. And instead, now you're inviting all these Python people. And like, you're not paying attention to us anymore. So that you know, like, I feel like there's got to be something like that. That may be going on. I don't feel that at all. Because I think, I don't think they're changing all the, all the R stuff to like for Python users. Like, I don't think. No, definitely really, not. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's like, I guess though, maybe your willingness to get a little critical, like that's what I'm trying to say is. You think that? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a little bit of that, but also I think there's just like, I don't know. I guess I would argue that there's like, I, I haven't, maybe I've had a new experience in terms of like having to teach it in this way. And it's, and it's like and, uh, just a number, maybe those issues were always there, but they never came up in the past. You know? And you're stressed. Like you need a break from podcasting. Right? <laughs> All this like, podcasting, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like you're flying back and forth. Like you've been setting up a house. Like it's so, you know, maybe, maybe. And then the undergrads, like everyone hates teaching. Apparently I saw this tweet that, um, it was like ask a manager, the person who writes that like 
a vice column and they were like, I've never in my entire life, like in, I've run this for 16 years and never in that time was there like a groundswell of one single profession writing me being like, I need out. <laughs> and now it's teachers doing that. So like something has happened. Well, like, well, I don't know what. Well, a lot of things have happened, I think. Um, and I think the teaching is not an issue for me. I think the issue for me is that like one thing that's good about teaching like an intro undergraduate class like this is that it's like the best mechanism for challenging all of your assumptions. Right. You know? Yeah. And I think when you teach a graduate class like I have for 20 years, like you can get away with a lot more stuff just because the graduate students are just more mature and they can figure stuff out. On their mm -hmm. own, you know? Yeah. They're not going to complain. They're too intimidated to like complain to you directly. I didn't understand half of what it was going on in classes. Like when you taught Git, I was just like, I have no idea what's happening right now. So, I, but I think like the undergrads ask questions, you know, that are a little different and they raise yeah. issues that I've never thought of before, honestly. And, um, and so I think that is useful because now it's like, oh, I've got to think about this a little bit more carefully. Yeah, so. I have to explain dots in the functions. Uh, I'll never explain dots because there's I no know. explanation. So. <laughs> I genuinely don't get it because sometimes you don't need the dot. Like, I don't know. It's like with the, um, and I like being super explicit. Like I would rather write way more verbose code that has every argument, even the like implicit arguments like spelled out. Right. Right. Yeah. I, don't, I thought about that. So like, I feel like what, one of the hallmarks of a data science class is that mm -hmm. you want to totally rewrite it every year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You're like, at least that's for me. For me, it's always like, I want to burn this whole thing down to the ground and start over next yeah. year. You know? That is true. We've had this vibe before. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I should just do the whole thing, just straight base R, not even load yeah. any packages, like just like whatever the packages that come with default R, that's what yeah. we're going to use, you know? This is like, it, you know... This is what you should do. First of all, we should have called it a podcast sabbatical. Okay. And this is what you should do during your sabbatical. I should burn it all down and write it. And yeah, create a just new totally one. right. The the idea of writing a course from scratch sounds so intimidating to me. Like, I was just going through that whole journey in my head of like, if I had to sit at my computer all summer and like create a class, I don't think I don't I don't know that I could do it. I think I would lose my mind. I don't know. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it feels Your instinct hard, is correct. And it feels like boring, which is terrible. I think teaching is fun, but just sitting there, like creating all the materials sounds like super boring. <laughs> well, I guess it's good that you're not in this business. Yeah. <laughs> How is that true? Or is it sometimes interesting? I think... It's like any other job, right? There's boring parts and there's exciting parts, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. the creating, there are parts of creating a class that are, that in my mind are really exciting. And I think really are kind of intellectual at a level that you don't experience anywhere else in this job, right? Yes. Yeah. Like even for sure. writing papers and whatever. Like, I think it's like having to teach, especially in an introductory course, like having to teach a complicated concept to an introductory course. That's like, in my, in my opinion, that's like one of the most interesting exercises you can do in this job. Yes. I, I agree from TA. That's how I felt. Like, I feel like there were certain things that I learned. I'm sure I've talked about it before, but that's how I learned like understood in my bones what a sampling distribution was was yeah. from teaching it and it's like very complicated and hard to explain and like big and little and like what's going on you know so yeah so i think that part is rewarding if you can figure it out um but you know there is a lot i would thinking this through now i would infinitely prefer a class where I am like making it up as I go along. Like I would so much rather teach a class, get the vibe from the students and then plan the next thing based on how the last class went. <laughs> That's but strategy. I, yeah. Cause a, I'm an adrenaline junkie and I put everything to the last minute. Right. So that would help. And then B, it would actually be interesting because you would be engaged with the audience versus just sitting in your office, like creating some theoretical roadmap, which may or may not work, right? 
Well, I mean, the road back definitely doesn't work. You have to adapt it as you go. But yeah. starting with nothing is just a recipe for burnout is what it comes down to. I mean, yeah, maybe start with like three weeks or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think that's typically what most people do. Like, they, you know, the, the, the typical situation is like, oh, I'm going to map out this whole class over the summer. Then like September rolls around. And you're like, I have three weeks. Yeah, so. that's that would be me. Too. I would spend all summer feeling guilty. Yeah. And then... There's an extent to which you can't plan out everything because you do have to see how they respond to whatever you said today like i can't write a lecture four weeks from now like or you know i could sketch it right like you know there could be an outline and you know bullet points or whatnot but like i can't say exactly what it's going to be because like they might be totally confused by something that comes before or just you know so. right yeah but don't you i mean i assume though that loosey-goosey approach to teaching you have to be relatively senior in order to do it no. And the class has to be a non staple, right? Like Well, yeah. It's not I think it's less about being senior and more about like what is the nature of the course. Yeah. Um, because if it's first of all, if it's a huge course, you can't just wing it. It you just Yeah. Can't, you know. Yeah. And because there's like a lot of moving parts and they all have to be synchronized. Um if it's a small course, you know, maybe. Yeah. Oh that's my nightmare. The people who taught those like six hundred people classes intro to statistics classes at hopkins like rewriting that from scratch yeah that's a oh huge my gosh lift. yeah 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 oh <laughs> but um anyway that's my so that's my feelings about r on april you know late april 2020 i know <laughs> We'll see if anyone reaches out and is like, we don't hate you, Hillary and Roger, but mostly I'm just, I'm feeling think, insecure. I don't think anyone hates me. <laughs> people, people love me. I just genuinely have not heard from the folks at our studio slash posit in a while. So are they, are you, you, I think they're all on Mastodon. Oh God. Really? Yeah. Are you on Mastodon? No. Yeah. I mean, I, I poke in there once in a while, but I honestly, I find it kind of boring. Yeah, no. <laughs> I think precisely because it's like it's all it's all data. Science. <laughs> it's all data right. Science yeah, stuff. like that's the last thing I want to talk about. No, yeah. Twitter's become like unreadable, though. Yeah, I don't it know. has too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Anyway, on, on that, that note, note, yeah, we'll have a good sabbatical, yeah, and uh, thank you. we'll keep in touch if the uh, apocalypse happens. Yeah, let me know because I probably won't be paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> and it, I mean, you really shouldn't rewrite your course until September because That's true. yeah, GPT can just write it for you. Yeah, you know? there may be no need to invest that effort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Bye, everyone.